May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be ever mindful of me, O Lord, my strength and my salvation. Amen. Amen. Would you please be seated? When I started off as a priest, well, and they trained me in seminary, same one Howard went to, by the way, so if you think I'm rotten, you should wait till Howard preaches next Sunday. Howard is going to be our guest preacher. Wait your hand, Howard. Glad everybody see you. Howard is going to be our preacher at the 1030 service on Palm Sunday. But I had to take classes in how to give a sermon. And part of the classes was how to be prepared when babies cry. <laughs> Kaylee has never once cried in church. <laughs> Evidently, my voice is a sepulchre. I put her to sleep. <laughs> and she has a wonderful time. They never told us about <coughs> cell phones. <laughs> I guess it was in the ancient time. You remember these things that were on the wall and put coins in them? And you, you turned this dial thing. And, I mean, and, and people had phone numbers that began with letters. <laughs> Goodness, I mean, I must be. Kate, Mary Kate has no idea what I'm talking about. She's never seen a payphone. Have you ever seen a typewriter? In the movies, yes. <laughs> oh my, but uh, I recall I was helping a friend at a church in London about 20 years, about 10, 2008. And it was during the Lambeth Conference, and that's when all the bishops from around the Anglican world gather in England for about two, three weeks, and I was there in various capacities. And on Sundays, we'd go out to different churches, and I thought I'd try something very different. I'd go to one of these really high church Anglo-Catholic citadels in London, where the clergy, you don't see their feet move, they sort of glide. <laughs> it's like they're on roller skates and everything. And I was in the congregation, and one of my friends was asked to vest and assist. And it was, it was the sort of church where the altar is against the back wall. And so the priest does everything with his back to you. And he has a deacon and a subdeacon. And it's very hard to see because all the incense is going off at one time. And they use the 1662 Book of Common Prayer. And it's... it's it's like the movies, it's beautiful. It doesn't get me spiritually, but it's fun to watch. It's like going to the opera. And my friend, I don't think in the last 10 years has ever been invited back. Because as the priest raised his hands and the choir began to sing, and he's on one side holding the edge of the priest's uh, uh, surplus. All of a sudden, you heard dee 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 dee. Oh. I wish I were in the land of cotton. Oh, no. <laughs> and you watch him like fumble in, trying to get under his stuff, fumble and turn it off. And you know, finally, by the time it goes, look away, look away, look away, Dixie Land. <laughs> I have to say, the magic of the moment was gone. <laughs> oh, my. I want to talk to you today about John's Gospel. It's going to be a shorter than usual sermon. No cheering, please. Because we've got a special presentation. The vestry has been invited Dwayne and Kathy Sipper from the path. Dwayne, Kathy, put your hands up. Then he's going to show a short film and talk about the important work they do in our community. The vestry has invited them, and this will be their third uh, service with us this weekend. So I'm not going to go by full half hour, 45 minutes. <laughs> well, okay, maybe I don't know. Football season doesn't start, so you don't have to get out of here by one o'clock. Well, what I want to talk to you about is Jesus' response to death. Now, the Bible was written not in English. There are some people, they're usually Baptists, who think it was written in English. And the words mean what they mean because that's what it says. But you have to remember, the Bible was not, is not the Quran. See, Muslims believe that Allah told Muhammad exactly what to write. Therefore, the Quran can have no mistake, no error. It is perfect. The Quran has the same standing that Jesus has. Because the Quran is God's direct revelation. The Bible, on the other hand, is inspired, it is from God, but through the vehicle of 
inspired men. Meaning people who were sinners, who forget things, who see things through the world that is, works according to their nature. In our uh, rector's forum, we went through Dante's uh, Paradiso today, the paradise. And one of the things we talked about was why everybody got so upset with Galileo and Copernicus. Because in their worldview, it looked like the sun went around the earth. It doesn't say that in the Bible. It doesn't say how astronomy works, but they just assume because that's what it looks like. So when these guys came up with a different way for science, well, you know, that's interesting. But for the, for the ancient world, the medieval world, they had constructed on top of scripture a way of seeing things that wasn't exactly biblical, but it made logical sense. So when we read the Bible, we need to read it with a spiritual eye open and need to understand that what is here, the printed word, may, needs to be sort of teased out. And in a perfect example, I think of teasing out <coughs> comes in sort of the bottom last quarter of this page with Jesus and Mary and Martha and the death of Lazarus. <coughs> Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping. He was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. Greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. That sounds like me at a funeral for a stranger. There, there, Ron, I'm sorry. In other words, it's not fake. But, you know, it's like distant pity. I'm deep, it, it almost sounds like a polite way of saying something. I'm deeply disturbed, and I'm very sad for your loss. What does the Greek say? What does the original language say? It says, Jesus snorted. I snorted. He wasn't deeply moved and disturbed. He snorted in disgust. He snorted like a horse, pawing its foot against the ground. Jesus' response to death was not genteel pity, but anger, outrage that sin had come into the world, had broken this relationship. And Jesus' response to the brokenness and sin in this world What's outrage that expressed in a snort? Not to be, he wasn't merely deeply moved and troubled. Friends, if you look out into the world around you today, you see loss and grief and pain and suffering. You're going to hear about the work of those people in our community who can't, don't have a place to sleep, who are battling drugs. <clears throat> And friends, if all we are is deeply moved and grieved, we're missing something. We're missing something. God calls us to give. You'll hear me say later in this service, what are the first, the first and greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. What's the second? To love your neighbor as yourself. We are called to love and to serve. We're called to respond to the outrages of this life, not with quiet passivity, but with indignation. When we see evil in the world, we are to respond. How we would respond? We would respond with love. We would respond with strength. We're not to respond with evil for evil, but we are still to respond. There's a book that's coming out in the next month. It's written by a, a, a Coleman acquaintance. I've known him for about 20 years. He's not close enough to be a friend. A man named Rod Dreher. And it's called The Benedict Option. And it's causing a lot of uh, uh, noise within the religious world. He's a, uh, he's a, he's a columnist for uh, National Review magazine and some other magazines. He's one of these Washington people, but he's also got a theological bend to him. And he's written a book that says that our culture has so far gone down the drain that Christians should follow the voices of Pope, Be uh, Pope Benedict and withdraw from the world. 
for little communities become like the Hasidic Jews, where we have our own little villages, own little towns, we only deal with each other, uh, you know, you only do business with other Jews, you only go to Jewish schools. The world is out there, and it's against us, and we need to withdraw. <clears throat> what would Jesus say to them? If you see evil in this world, should we respond by being mightily upset and passive and turning our backs and walking away and saying, no, folks, I'm not going to be there? Or should we start? with outrage. Are we to be a little perfect preserve of people? Or are we to be a yeast or salt and light to the world? The world's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be fixed. Though they tell me life in the villages is pretty nice. <laughs> but if we give up on the world and turn our back on it, and solely focus on ourselves. We are denying Christ himself. Jesus Christ, again and again, he would, he would sit with the publicans and the prostitutes and the good and the righteous and the true people. The good Jews would say to him, why are you hanging out with these people? Why are you hanging out with these sinners? Didn't you come to save the elect? Jesus said, those who aren't sick have no need of a physician. We are called, what does he mean by that? We are called to reach out to the world in love, in power, in grace. Now, we're not little gods. Let's not think that we can fix things. But we still need to have our hearts Oh, in my lifetime, and, I'm, and I know in your lifetimes as well, what have we seen in our country? We've overcome so many things. Oh, I've mentioned this in the past, but you can go to parts of our diocese, the older parts of the diocese, and in Fort Pierce, Florida, there are two Episcopal churches about a half mile apart. Why? One's for white people, one's for black people. That's the way we always did it. Go to Daytona Beach, go to Orlando, it's like that. That's the old South that Florida once was. And we have spent two, three generations trying to overcome that brokenness. When we look at people at the color of their skin, not as Martin Luther King said, by the content of their character. You know, if we just sat back and closed our eyes to the world around us and didn't do the good, what example is Jesus then to us? He's a meddler. He's getting involved in things. He could have just gone and talked to the elect, had a very nice life. He could have been a, a lovely, wonderful, happy, clappy God. But he went to the cross for strangers, for you, for me, for sinners, for blacks, for whites. Even Italians. <laughs> so that all may have eternal life. Friends, there's a temptation to withdraw, to pull up the gates around our castle and just say the hell of the world. <coughs> I don't think that's what our word tells us to do. I think he calls us to love. That means loving every not just those who we already like. That means reaching out to those in prison. That means reaching out to members of our congregation or housebound, or who, through illness, may not be that pleasant. They're still part of our family. We must love them and be there for them, because that's what God commands us, I believe. Amen. Amen. Friends, would you please stand and join with me in saying the nice